morning. I was at Strata last year, and I started with a slide that looked something like this. And the big question in the middle last year was for why. Why would Microsoft actually adopt uh, Apache Hadoop? And a lot has changed in a year. Uh, since the last time we talked, the term we use for our Apache Hadoop infrastructure and software and services is HD Insight. We've shipped a version of HD Insight service on our Azure cloud platform and have a number of first and third party uh, properties using it. One of them is Xbox and Xbox Live, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes in the context of Halo. Another thing that we've released uh, is a version of HD Insight through the web platform installer. So you can have Hadoop running on your Windows laptop in a couple of clicks and a couple of minutes, and there are samples and such for folks to get started. And then tomorrow, uh, you can order the next version of PDW, our massively parallel data warehouse, uh, which scales to petabytes of data. And we have the first generation of a technology we call Polybase, which melds the world of Hadoop and traditional large-scale enterprise data warehousing. So being able to query uh, over data in HDFS uh, with SQL in a very simple way. So made a lot of progress there. The other thing that we said last year at this talk was that we wanted to be true members of the community. And so we have done a lot in the last year in that context as well. We've been working with Hortonworks. They recently announced HTTP on Windows. Um, we have a team at Microsoft now working on some technology, for those of you familiar with the uh, Hadoop uh, ecosystem, above Yarn to do more interesting computation. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and finally, this is one thing that I wouldn't have expected last year. Uh, Chris Douglas, who was recently elected to be the working group chair for the Hadoop working group in the Apache Software Foundation, uh, is a Microsoft employee. So there's a lot that we've done, and I think you know, if we change that in a year, we've actually sort of followed through on uh, the commitments that we stayed up here and talked about last year. So we talk about big data, and we talk about any new technology. I think is for all of us who are trying to build tools, uh, to make it real, we need to look at what are the measures of value? What are the things that we're really trying to improve? And there are two that we've uh, come to focus on that have remained incredibly robust. And there was time to insight, or it could be called time to initial insight. And that's a function of having accessibility to data, uh, having the right tools to do something interesting with that data. And the most important term here is the intuition. And the interesting thing about this is that the intuition cannot be sublet. It's hard to transfer the intuition. So the key here is to bring the tools to the people who have the intuition. And so you can almost think of this time to initial insight. It's the latency between the hmm and the aha, right? And how do we you know, bring that down smaller and smaller? And then this other notion of return on accessible data. And accessible turns out to be a key word there, because in this new world of ambient data, more and more of it is potentially accessible. And how do we do that in a meaningful way? And so hold on to those two thoughts. And then the final thing, in terms of all of us as technologists bringing this to people, it's how do we consumerize it? And people have probably heard of the consumerization of IT. Think about it in the context of uh, making something magical by kind of making it invisible. And so there are two sides of this equation. There's the production side. And then how do we make it easier and easier for more and more people to produce things of value? And then on the consumption side, how do we just have it be part of making aspects of everyday life better? Uh, so these three things come together in really interesting ways in terms of what's driving us. Time to insight, return on accessible data, and then how do we scale it to the masses, both on the production and the consumption side? So as an example of just on the consumption side, how it can change an experience, uh, think about Halo. For those of you who don't know John, Master Chief in the Halo franchise, it's an amazingly popular game on Xbox. There are millions of players hundreds of thousands of games played per hour. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about this industry, much like many others, they've changed over the last five years from delivering things every couple of years, so a game title every couple of years on DVD, to now more and more update. And in the case of Halo, uh, there's a new mode in the game in the latest release, Halo 4, called Spartan Ops. And this is episodic content that's released every several weeks. So if you think about the world you came from, where you could test aspects of the game with a beta testing group and, you know, for several months, if you're releasing things every couple of weeks, you don't have that. So that business itself is forcing faster time to insight. So the Halo team, and uh, Jerry Hook is the, on the data side, uh, they have instrumented Halo 4 to collect a large amount of data from the game. And they just place the data up in Azure storage. 
and they didn't know what they were going to do with it. They just built what I sometimes refer to as a digital shoebox. Then what they did come along, and they're analyzing that in you know, near real time as people are playing. And it's interesting sort of the insights they're able to glean from this right now. And I'll, I'll share a couple of sort of the social aspects. So they didn't know what types of value they were going to get out of it. And, and when I talk to Jerry, it's almost like he's apologetic because he's saying, oh, we're just starting, we're just starting. But then he's so excited about the potential. And they are doing things like detecting uh, when people hack their profile to try to do mods that are crazy. Like uh, they detected someone, they called it the uh, headless Spartan. So someone figured out how to hack the profile to have an invisible head. And you can imagine a first-person shooter uh, having invisible body parts that don't register hits is a, is a thing they need to be concerned with. Other things that they've been able to find um, are aspects of the gameplay where the designers had a particular thing in mind, and the play doesn't work out that way. And so it's interesting in terms of closing the loop. One of the things that he described was a case where they, the designers expected someone to pick up a particular weapon, use it in a particular way under a particular context. When they monitor the gameplay with the big data environment, they see that that's not what people are doing. And maybe they're not engaging in the way that they want to. Closing the loop, one of the things that they can do is go interact with some of the uh, influential people in the social forum, those are in Xbox Live, to let them know about certain things. And then they can watch that propagate through the community in terms of people picking that up. So they're much more able to react and respond uh, in, in, in this incredible play. Now, the most interesting thing about one of the conversations I had with Jerry was a point where he got really excited. Uh, once the data team figured out what they could do, they took that to the designers. And they're like, what do you have for questions? What do you have for questions? And the designers looked at them, well, what are you talking about? Uh, and it took them some time to get the flywheel going for the designers to realize that they could actually get answers to questions that they never really figured that they could get an answer to that quickly. So they could turn things around in a couple of hours and actually do something about it versus a context where it didn't matter, you're going to ship a game, and the only chance you have to update it is a year or two later when you change the title. So it's an amazing shift. So this time to insight in that context, getting inside the loop, going from you know, an order of a year to a couple of hours has this amazing power. And you can imagine that surfacing in the gameplay, uh, ultimately just as part of the portal that the game player sees. So the, the big data enriching their experience um, just as they're playing the game. So switching gears, let's take a look real quickly at the data science process. If you abstractly look at the workflow, it looks like this. How do you gather the data and prepare it? How do you form intuitions and validate them? How do you create and tune the model? And then it's about getting the results and deploying and operationalizing it. And this is you know, pretty much abstractly for all of these processes. So if we go back to time to insight, return on accessible data, and then figure out what we can do to make this process more efficient, one of the things that we actually, it's available for download, uh, it's called the Data Explorer. You can go down in the booth and uh, show some, the guys will demonstrate it for you. What we did is built this tool to make it really easy to find, gather, refine uh, data, and then share it with others. So here's uh, showing it as an add-in in Excel. So you can search for data, preview it, and then there's a use link. And then you can just bring it into a sheet. And for, I, I suspect there are a lot of people in this audience who have done the text to columns thing, who have then gone and you know, done the shift, they've the index for the comma, substring. Uh, and that's great. You can you know, clean stuff up. But then what, if I asked you, hey, repeat that. I want you to do that every day, every hour. Uh, it would make your head hurt, sort of like the, the guys earlier in the, the lead-in video. One of the things that happens here is you go through and use gestures to do things like renaming columns. In this particular case, um, I actually have population density. Then I have another sheet that represents GDP growth that I searched for. And then I joined the two of them, look for correlations there. Now, what's going on in the background, though, is that you're actually writing a program. So through all those gestures, you're creating a program that then we can schedule and run uh, and repeat. And it's a declarative um, data flow transformation language. Uh, that you can imagine us you take 10,000 rows of data, figure out how you want to transform it, and then we can schedule that across a petabyte of data in Hadoop to go do that in a production context. So bringing it to the people who have the intuition and then making it really easy to turn it into sort of a production flow is uh, sort of the aim here. Now, if you go down to the booth, uh, there's a team down there that will show you they've got 30 years of financial history. Uh, they restrict it by taking another data set for the S&P 500, and then in a couple of minutes, they actually do some interesting analysis on it. So that's that tool. 
So in terms of the consumerization of big data, if we think about it end to end, tools and ecosystem need to make it much easier, and the data explorer is uh, something that we've done in that space. Forming the intuitions. This is, I think, one of the most critical points of the intuitions don't translate well. It's hard to take your hunch and tell someone else who's going to tell someone else who's actually going to do something with it. So uh, in the world of traditional IT and data warehousing, where changing the schema, doing the ETL, loading things could take a couple of months, most good ideas that happened in the shower kind of went down the drain. Okay? Uh, in this world, it's about closing that so that you can uh, validate your intuitions so, and, or falsify your hypothesis really, really quickly. And then tuning models and operationalizing. So where people who are working with the data, those who are actually have their hands in it, they want to be able to focus just on that middle phase. And then tooling can help out at the end as well. And we've actually got a lot of stuff going on uh, through this end to end. And you know, perhaps next time, we'll focus more on the back end in terms of operationalizing the stuff and scaling it out. So with that, I'll close. Uh, through the arc, time to insight, intuition being the key term there, return on accessible data. How do we actually make it easier to bring it in, combine it, and refine it, and such? Uh, and I think we did a great job making good on our uh, commitment to Hadoop and to the community this year. And uh, look forward to you know, a lot of interesting things coming up this year as well. So if you want, uh, the big data page is sort of the landing spot and portal if you want to get HD Insight in your laptop or whatnot. So that's it. Thank you very much.